All right, welcome to ECE 165. Uh, this is lecture two, where we're going to get just get started on an introduction uh, to CMOS logic. So for those of you following along uh, in the uh, textbook at home, we're going to start with the basics of static CMOS. OK, so hopefully you all know uh, what CMOS means. Uh, we've covered this in previous courses, specifically the uh, prerequisite to this course, EC102. Um, but uh, what we're going to talk about uh, today specifically is a little bit of the basics on static CMOS. Um, and that is uh, as opposed to other types of CMOS like dynamic CMOS, uh, which are uh, digital logic families that we'll talk about uh, later on in the course. So if you're following along at home, chapters one and two are the ones uh, in the Weston Harris book that you're going to want to read. Okay, now before we can get into a lot of the details of um, how to actually build a digital logic circuits, we have to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to MOS transistors. Okay, it's really important that we understand a little bit of the transistor physics, uh, a little bit of what they look like and so on and so forth in order for us to uh, appreciate and understand how to design and optimize digital integrated circuits. Okay, so there are two basic types of transistors available. Transistors available in complementary MOS or in other words, CMOS uh, processes. NMOS and PMOS. Okay, N-type and uh, P-type uh, metal oxide semiconductor transistors. So let's take a look first at the NMOS transistor. Uh, we can draw a uh, cross section of what that transistor looks like. So typically we'll implement this on some sort of P-substrate. So this is silicon that is uh, doped uh, in the P form. And then we have um, N plus regions here where it's heavily doped uh, N. And underneath this, we have a, or rather on top of this, we have a gate dielectric material here. Um, and on top of that, uh, let's choose a different color here we have an actual metal gate, all right? So we call this terminal the gate of the transistor. This terminal is the source. This terminal is the drain. Um, and uh, that is a basic uh, NMOS transistor. Now, typically this uh, gate material here is polysilicon uh, in older processes. In more modern processes, it's now some form of metal. Okay, the insulator uh, in older processes, this is an uh, insulator. In older processes, this uh, typically tended to be silicon dioxide. Uh, now it's, uh, oh, I don't know, some sort of hafnium dioxide or something like this. Okay, um, some sort of high K material. Okay, now this is a three terminal device, um, but uh, when we're implementing this in a um, bulk CMOS technology, that means the, the entire substrate of the, of, of the wafer that we're fabricating this on is doped in, in one flavor, uh, and that flavor is essentially everywhere. We actually also have a fourth terminal uh, that we draw here typically with a P plus region, and we call this the bulk or the body. Okay, so we need to bias this P substrate, which uh, is very large relative to the size of a single transistor uh, at some voltage. Okay, so typically uh, we go ahead and draw the symbol for such a transistor in schematic form as follows. We have our gate, our drain, and our source terminal. Um, in analog integrated circuit design, we typically put the little arrow on the transistor uh, to indicate whether it's an NMOS or a PMOS. In digital design, we typically uh, just um, get lazy and don't uh, tend to do that, and, and we'll just uh, leave the arrow off. As you'll see, when we get to the PMOS, we'll use a bubble to indicate if it's a, if it's a PMOS. Now, we also have to be sure to add the bulk terminal here. It's a, it's a very important terminal. Okay, so this is 
let me just draw a note here. This is some, um, oops. This is sometimes omitted, uh, but at least in a bulk uh, process, it's always there. So if it's omitted, um, we'll uh, introduce some, uh, essentially some uh, rules of thumb that says if it's omitted, we, we pretty much know where it's connected to, and so we just don't bother drawing it. Um, but uh, if it's explicitly shown, then uh, you know we have to be explicit about where we actually connect it. Now, an NMOS transistor, uh, we say turns, oops, turns on when the gate voltage is high. Okay, and this is really going to be the basis of how we're actually going to build digital logic families. We say the gate turns on when its voltage is high, uh, which essentially implies when the when the input to the transistor is one, then the transistor turns on and, and something happens at its output. Um, so this, you know, those of you who haven't uh, studied or thought about digital electronics before, this may seem a little uh, abstract, but we'll get into a, a lot more details uh, very quickly about what, uh, what that really means. Okay, uh, but for now, uh, let's just uh, leave it there, uh, move on to the PMOS transistor, and we'll get back to, to, to what we mean by, by how, how to actually construct digital logic functions out of these sort of transistors. So that was the uh, NMOS device. Uh, we also, of course, have our PMOS device. And the PMOS uh, looks, uh, at least to, to first order, largely similar to the NMOS device. We have our, our P substrate. I'm just going to abbreviate that as a P sub. Um, now, if we want to make a PMOS device, we actually, ha it turns out, have to put this in an N well in order to create our P plus regions as follows, uh, after which we construct our usual transistor. So we have our, our gate dielectric, again, either silicon dioxide or some sort of hafnium or zirconium oxide, some sort of high K dielectric. That connects to the gate terminal here. We have our uh, source terminal here, drain terminal here. Um, but now we have this N well, we have to bias the N well at some potential. So we'll add in another high dope region here, and that's gonna be the bulk of the, of, of the device. Okay, and so that's the, the N well. So that completes the picture of the PMOS transistor. Of course, the P substrate then has to be biased at something, but uh, that'll be biased uh, essentially by the, um, by the uh, NMOS transistors. Now the schematic that we use to uh, indicate a PMOS device in digital circuits, we typically use the bubble notation. So again, this is the gate, this is the source, this is the drain. And by the way, these transistors are symmetric. So the, the source and the drain uh, is uh, arbitrary. It really depends on the direction of current uh, is flowing through the transistor on which one ends up being the, um, the source or the drain. Now, of course, we can't forget our body uh, or our bulk uh, contact here. Um, that uh, is, is always essential. Again, if it's not drawn, it's there, but we just have to be uh, aware of um, uh, what it's usually contacted to. Okay. Now, the uh, PMOS transistor, unlike the NMOS transistor, we say it turns on when the gate voltage is low. Okay, so it's effectively the opposite effect. And that makes sense. You know, this is the P-type device versus the N-type device. So we should expect its behavior to be the opposite. Okay, so what we've drawn here are, these are transistors in what we call a bulk CMOS process. Um, and what we mean by this is that the substrate that this uh, transistor is on is, is common to all of the other substrates of all of the other transistors on your chip. Um, and typically it's this P type substrate, um, which means that the bulk of all of the NMOS transistors are all connected together. Okay, and again, we'll get into some of these details a little bit more uh, later on in the course. Uh, but I wanted to mention this here because uh, there are also other types of processes. There are also 
uh, other types of processes we call silicon on insulator, abbreviated as SOI, uh, processes that look like the following picture. We'll draw it on the next slide here. Okay, so first we start with our, uh, essentially our body terminal, if you will, we'll call this uh, P. Next to that we have an N terminal, N plus, N plus, and this is our source, this is our drain. We have our gate dielectric here, and our either uh, poly or metal uh, gate uh, connected um, in the usual manner up here. Okay, but then underneath all of this, I guess I'll draw it in red here, we have a bunch of extra oxide or insulator. Okay, and then underneath all of this is our silicon substrate. And maybe it's p-type. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It's not really uh, accessible. Okay. So in this type of device, uh, we have no access to the bulk contact. Oops. Okay. Um, now this is um, a somewhat popular type of process option. Uh, there, there, there's a lot, particularly in the RF uh, space, uh, that are going to uh, silicon on insulator uh, technologies for a variety of different reasons. Um, but even if we do have an SOI process, some transistors may not have access to this bulk contact. Uh, some processes, processes, plural here, may allow bulk contact. In fact, most of them do, uh, if you really want to, to contact to the bulk of the transistor. Okay, so um, what I'm, I'm gonna say now is a, is a general rule of thumb that I think is fairly true uh, in industry uh, as and, it, and will certainly be true in this class, is that unless otherwise specified, Unless otherwise specified, assume we are working in bulk CMOS. Okay, we'll tell you if we are working in SOI. Um, in such cases, when we're working in bulk CMOS, assume the NMOS bulk is always connected to the lowest on chip potential. This is usually ground or GND. Okay, now note this is different from discrete devices. Um, typically when you were uh, in your, your prior classes, uh, well, probably you were working mostly with BJTs, but if you did work with uh, MOSFETs, you often assume that the source was connected to the bulk all the time. Uh, but that's not the case here. So if we just draw, say for example, a stack of two NMOS devices uh, connected in series like so, um, what we typically assume is that bulk terminal of that top device there is typically connected to ground. Uh, and unfortunately, yes, that does uh, increase the complexity of the analysis uh, that we have to do, uh, but this is realistic. Now, of course, that bottom device, because its source terminal is ground, uh, its source terminal is connected uh, to the bulk terminal. Okay. Uh, now, one note here, uh, in PMOS, we can connect the bulk to the source if we want, if it helps. And the reason we can do this is because we have that entire device connected in its own 
uh, end well, and uh, that end well can be distinct from the end well of an adjacent PMOS. It can be, of course, distinct from the P substrate. So we can, if we choose, uh, choose to connect the bulk of, of a PMOS device to, to wherever we want, typically to the source, uh, if that tends to help in the design. So in circuit design classes, we often draw these uh, cross sections of uh, MOS transistors and sometimes of BJT transistors. Um, but sometimes a cross section is a little difficult to kind of really wrap your head around. So, so what I'm going to attempt to do, uh, and uh, by no means am, am I claiming to be an expert artist here, but I'm going to attempt to draw a three-dimensional-ish version of a transistor. Okay, so I'm going to draw it like this. Let's see. Let me label the uh, the heading here. So this is a 3D transistor drawing. Okay, so this is going to be the, the gate. Uh, we have our gate dielectric underneath. So we'll draw this as, as we drew in the cross-section area. So this is an insulating material. All right, then I'm gonna draw the first N plus region, and that's going to go this way like so, underneath the transistor like so. The second N plus region, and uh, I guess we'll do it something like that, and the P substrate uh, is underneath. Okay, I'd say that's uh, pretty uh, pretty well executed. Okay, and uh, so, so this is the uh, rough uh, three-dimensional sketch of uh, what the uh, transistor looks like. Now, one thing that, that I like to ask uh, the, the class in this, in this scenario is, which dimension here is the width of the transistor and which dimension is the length? Okay, so clearly we have perhaps this dimension here as one possibility. This dimension is also another possibility. Uh, we also have this dimension here um, clearly that's not going to be the width or the length of the transistor. That's going to be something else. In fact, that's going to be a, 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 um, a parameter we call Tox or the thickness of the oxide. Uh, but it turns out that the width of the transistor is actually this dimension over here and the length of the transistor is this dimension here. So, so this is the length because when charge has to go from, let's say the, the drain to the source, and this of course is the gate. When charge goes from the from the drain uh, to the source, it has to traverse a length L, okay? And it gets to do so in multiple parallel paths that is proportional to W, okay? So that's the width of the transistor. So the length of the transistor, um, uh, for example, will be something like 45 nanometers. Okay, so that it turns out is what we're going to actually use in this class. We're going to use a 45 nanometer process technology. So when you hear uh, people talking about the latest Intel processors or something like this, they'll often say, oh, this was developed in uh, 16 nanometer or 11 nanometer or something like this. Uh, that's what they're referring to. They're referring to the minimum gate length uh, that is available to us in that process, in that particular process technology. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to move on to now is, is we have a little bit of understanding of uh, what these transistors look like. We're going to get back to a little bit of the transistor physics and some of those equations uh, that describe the behavior of the transistors. Uh, but before we do that, I want to take a quick uh, 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 detour on CMOS logic, okay? So we'll get into functional descriptions of, uh, of what these uh, transistors and how we can arrange them uh, uh, to, to, to work in, in, in logic uh, families. Uh, and then in the next lecture, we'll get into describing the, uh, the equations, the physics of, of how these transistors actually work. So let's uh, create a new subheading here called CMOS logic, okay? Now, Boolean algebra, represents information using ones and zeros. Okay, in CMOS, in CMOS logic, we map logic 
1, I'll draw it as a proper 1 here, to the highest supply voltage we have in our system. We typically call this VDD. And logic 0, maybe I'll put a bar there through here to make sure that's not logic O, logic 0 to the lowest potential we have available in our system, typically ground or GND. So we can, using this mapping, if you will, we can construct logic gates out of transistors using our switch model. Okay, so using the switch model of a transistor, we can do this easily. Okay, uh, for example, let's take a look at the most basic Boolean algebra building block we can think of, the inverter. Okay, we can draw this uh, pictorially as follows. This is a typical uh, schematic uh, of an inverter gate. Uh, we can also, if we really uh, want to be precise about things, we can draw a truth table. So when the input uh, to this uh, Boolean inverter is a zero, the output is, well, what do you know, a one. And similarly, when the input is one, the output is zero. Okay, so this will be on the final exam. Okay, <laughs> so uh, what we can do then is we can construct a model of how to actually build that inverter using transistors. Okay, so before we just assume that we have this magical element that when we introduce a logic one to it, it produces a logic zero at the output. But how do we build that in the physical world? Well, we have to um, you know, use transistors. So it turns out our switch model of our NMOS and PMOS devices is perfectly suited to doing this. Okay, so what we can do is construct the following circuit. Okay, so we have two transistors stacked in series. One is an NMOS, one is a PMOS device, and we connect their inputs together. We call this in, we use a solder dot here, and this is out, okay? Uh, this, by the way, is, is the symbol for VDD that we'll use in this course, and this is the symbol for ground, okay? So we can use our switch model that we uh, introduced uh, in the earlier uh, part of this lecture and make sure that when input is zero, we get an output that is logic one. Okay, so let's just go ahead and, and analyze that case. When in equals zero, we get the following circuit. So remember, we're gonna essentially make uh, switches out of our NMOS and PMOS transistors. And they are uh, being activated by this input signal, which is equal to logic zero. Okay, now we said for an NMOS transistor, when its gate voltage is low or logic zero, then it is an open circuit, okay? And for a PMOS transistor, when its gate voltage is low or zero, it is a short circuit, okay? So I'll just draw a little arrow saying that is the output, okay? So in this, or that this is the direction of the switch. So in this case, the output voltage is going to be what? Well, we have a switch connecting the output to VDD which is of course equal to logic one. So perfect, when the input was zero, we have a logic one at the output. Now similarly, when input is equal to logic one, we get the following circuit model. In this case, the PMOS device is open, the NMOS device is closed. I'm running a little bit out of room here. N equals one, that's trying to activate these two gate devices. So again, when the, when the when the gate of an NMOS device is high or logic one, then it is on, or in other words, it switches closed, okay? Um, similarly, the gate of a PMOS device, when it is uh, one or high, that device is not on. So in other words, it's an open circuit. So in this case, the output voltage is connected to ground, which is of course logic zero, okay? So what this means is that when the input is one, we get a logic zero, at the output. So that's great. That's what inverter is supposed to do. Um, and indeed, that's exactly what it does. So what we just drew here models the, oops, models the logical 
behavior of a CMOS inverter. Uh, later, we will characterize its speed, power consumption, etc. Okay, and that's going to be really, really important uh, for the rest of the class. We want to build digital circuits, but we want them to build them to be good. You know, we want to actually be be able to use them uh, in a way that uh, that uh, uh, you know offers the most uh, bang for buck or the most performance or whatever it is that we're most interested in optimizing. Okay, so that was just an inverter. Let's take a look at a slightly more uh, complicated logical gate. Let's try and look at the two input NAND gate. Okay, so the two input NAND gate looks something like this. We have inputs A, B, and output C. Okay, so what we're going to do is construct a truth table, A, B, and output C, okay? So all the possible combinations of inputs and outputs in the truth table are here. Uh, what is the output uh, C going to, to, to be, okay? So when A and B are both zero, that means A and B is zero. So an AND gate is the complement of an AND gate. Uh, so C will be one. Uh, when either A or B uh, are zero, um, then the output is also going to be one. Uh, the output C will only be zero when both A and B are both one, uh, which is uh, A and B together, uh, and it together is one, and then the complement of that is, of course, zero. Okay, so we have our truth table. That's, again, not rocket science to build a truth table like this, but uh, it actually does help to conceptualize how we're going to actually build um, our uh, transistor level model for uh, such a device. Okay. So what I'd like to say here is the goal of this exercise is to develop a network of NMOS and PMOS switches that set C, output C, to the correct VDD or GND level, depending, of course, on A and B. We also must avoid short circuiting VDD and ground. We don't ever want to connect VDD and ground together um, through switches. Uh, then we just have short circuit current and that's when things melt and blow up and so on and so forth. So we definitely want to avoid that situation. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce some design guidelines to help us through uh, logic synthesis. Okay, so let's take a look at these. These are static CMOS design guidelines. Okay. Step number one is NMOSs should only, oops, a very tall U, should only be used to pass logic zeros and PMOSs. Uh, only for logic ones. So it turns out there's a very good reason for this. I'm going to ask why. 
Um, there's a very good reason for this, um, and I'd like you to think about this uh, very carefully, uh, and we'll uh, get into this uh, perhaps in a future class. Well, definitely, actually, in a future class. Okay, so that's guideline uh, number one. Guideline number two is the following basic structure uh, can be used. Okay, so this is a structure that we're going to use throughout the rest of this course, so make sure to understand it uh, very carefully. Okay, so we're going to say VDD is up here, VDD. What we're going to do is we're going to have some network of PMOSs, devices here, some network of NMOS devices down here. This is the output. And MOSs are connected to ground, and we have inputs. And it's possible there may be multiple inputs here. We're going to designate that with just a line through it to indicate that that could be potentially multiple inputs or outputs. Okay. Now, um, this is the basic structure. We said we only want PMOSs to pass logic ones, which means PMOSs should be connected to VDD. We call this the pull up network. or pun for short, no pun intended. Uh, similarly, the NMOS devices are, should only be used to pass logic zeros, which means that the NMOS network should be connected to ground. Uh, so we call this the pull down network, or the PDN. Okay, so again, what we mean by this is that if a, P, if a PMOS transistor in the pull-up network is going to be activated, it's going to be turned on, it's going to connect itself between VDD and the output, which means it's going to pull the output up to VDD. Now, hopefully, if we've constructed our circuit properly, when that situation happens, no NMOS transistor in the pull-down network will be activated, um, because if it were, one of those NMOS devices would turn on, it would connect the output to ground, and it would want to try and pull that output output down to ground. Now, of course, we don't want the, the output being tried to be pulled in two different directions, and we don't know which direction it's going to go into. It's going to be short circuit condition. We really want to avoid that. So only one of the pulled up or pulled down networks will ever be on at once. Uh, and that is actually the third guideline is only one of the pull up network or pull down network will be on at once. Oops. At once. And the reason for this is this uh, prevents short circuit uh, between VDD and ground. BTW uh, in my shorthand means between, not by the way. All right, so in the previous slide, we, we discussed uh, static CMOS design guidelines, um, and that's really all you need to know, um, and you can kind of figure out the rest later if, if you will. Uh, but I'm going to take it one step further and uh, suggest some useful constructs that we're going to see time and time again uh, throughout this course. Okay, um, and what I mean by useful constructs are basically just uh, collections of gates uh, that uh, effectively produce uh, specific behaviors here. Okay, so the first useful construct that we'll look at is the AND construct. Okay, the AND construct uh, uh, in NMOS transistors looks something like this. Okay, if you have two NMOS transistors in series, let's call this input A, this input B, then this construct is a short um, is a short circuit. Sorry here, circuit. Uh, we'll just abbreviate this as short circuit when both A and B are equal to one. Okay. Now we have a similar construct out of PMOS devices. Uh, 
uh, with A and B at the gate here. Again, this is a short circuit when, in this case, A bar and B bar are both equal to one. Okay, so that is our AND construct. We also have an OR construct that looks something like this. We have, uh, in this case, we'll have two NMOS transistors in parallel here. So this is A, this is B. This is a short circuit when one of A or B is equal to one, which makes sense. If, if uh, A is equal to one, but B isn't, uh, the top transistor is going to short the bottom transistor is still going to be open, but it doesn't matter. Those two points of the wires are connected together. Okay, and similarly for the PMOS, we have again a similar type of structure here. Two PMOS devices in parallel. I should put the solder dots here to be extra precise. If this is A and B, this is a short circuit when one of A bar or B bar is equal to one. Okay, so now that we have these useful constructs uh, sorted out, let's go back to our NAND2 uh, example and complete it. Okay, so we started on this uh, uh, quest of uh, trying to figure out uh, how to build a, a two input NAND gate. By the way, when I say NAND2, the, the latter number just refers to the number of inputs. As you can imagine, we can have a three input NAND gate. We would call that a NAND3 uh, type of device. Okay, so, um, what we can do is let's actually go back and look at that truth table. Okay, so just for completeness, I'm just going to redraw it here. Uh, A, B, C, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and this was 1, 1, 1, 0. Now, in this case, I'm going to add two additional columns. Okay, I'm going to add a pull down network column and a pull up network column. Okay, so specifically, let's let's first look at the pull down network. At which point is the pull down network on? Well, the only time the pull down network is on is when the output is zero, right? So in this case, the pull down network will be on. In all the other cases, the pull down network is going to be off. Okay, and just by our design guidelines earlier, that means that the pull up network should be the opposite of this. Um, but let's just make sure that that makes sense logically. The pull up network will only be on when the output should be one. Okay, so that occurs in, in these cases here. And if the output is not one, then it should be off. Uh, so indeed, the pull up network and the pull down network are complements of each other. Okay, so what we can now do is we have essentially a truth table for the pull up and the pull down networks. Let's, let's figure out what logic function corresponds to each of these networks. Okay, so the pull down network should be on when, under what condition? The pull down network is on when, well, the output is zero, uh, but if we look at the inputs, the pull down network is on when both A and B are equal to one. Okay, so that looks like an AND construct that, that we showed on the previous slide. Similarly, the pull up network is on under what condition? Well, the pull up network is on when either, when one of A or B is zero. Okay, so we can write that down in Boolean algebra as when A bar or B bar is high, okay? So when one of A or B is zero or when one of A bar or B bar is equal to one, okay? So what this means is we can, we, we effectively have these two logic functions from our useful constructs on our previous slide here. So now we can by inspection, just draw our circuit. Okay, so this is VDD. The pull up network is going to be one of those or useful constructs, solder dots, so this is A, that's B, and the pull down network, let's take this output, this is output C here. The pull down network is one of those and useful constructs. So this is uh, A and this is B, okay? So there you have it. That is our first uh, slightly more complicated logic gate, at least more complicated than an inverter. So that's our pull down network. This is our pull up network, okay? So that wasn't uh, too hard. Um, let's write a few notes. Uh, note one. 
the pull up network and pull down network are duals of each other. And it's actually quite interesting. We can get into some graph theory and show how this, uh, they really are duals and, and so on and so forth. Um, note number two, uh, this static CMOS method or design method with pull up network and uh, pull up networks and pull down networks can only implement inverting functions. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean is that if G is some function of inputs, that function has to be an inverting function, okay? So what we mean by that is G can equal A and B inverted, that's an AND gate, G can be equal to A or B and C, all inverted, um, but it cannot be G is equal to A or B and C, for example, okay? So one question is, well, how would we get this? Oops. Well, um, there's two methods. One is either we put an inverter after, you build the inverting function and then just put an inverter after, or if we have access to inverted inputs, if we access, have access to A bar, for example, then perhaps we can actually recreate this function directly. But if we don't have access to any inverted inputs, then the only way to, uh, to create this logical function uh, is to put an inverter uh, after, the, after your, your circuit. Okay, so that was a, a one particular uh, example, a NAND gate. Uh, let's get a little bit more general and let's talk about how to implement arbitrary functions. in static CMOS. Okay, so again, I'm gonna break this down into uh, two steps, okay? And these are very difficult steps. I'm kidding. So step one is realize the pull down network by inspection. Okay, so you might say, well, that's not really a step. That's just saying do it. Um, and uh, bear with me, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go through an example that will hopefully make this uh, fairly clear. If you can't do it by inspection, uh, you can look at the truth table. And, and this will help uh, guide you to, to how to actually build this circuit, okay? Step two is use De Morgan's theorem, and yes, I realize that some of you may have learned at De Morgan's theorem uh, uh, more than one year ago and uh, hoped that you never had to, to look at it again, but uh, sorry, you'll have to, uh, to look at it again now. Um, use De Morgan's theorem to manipulate the, uh, the function to the point where the pull up network uh, can be implemented by inspection. 
Okay, so again, you might be thinking, well, uh, Professor Mercer, that's not terribly useful. You're basically just telling us to do it. Um, bear with me. I, I think it, it will uh, eventually make sense, uh, particularly when we go through an example. Okay, so let's go through an example. F equals A or B and C all inverted. Okay. So it turns out that that step one is actually fairly easy once you wrap your head around it. Okay, so let's synthesize our pull down network. Okay, so we have A, or B and C. So we know an OR construct is two parallel transistors. The current can go through one path or the other. Uh, it doesn't really matter which which one or both. Uh, both will achieve the same function. Okay. Similarly, the AND construct is two series transistors. Okay, uh, and uh, so if we want B and C, then we should put two transistors in series. Okay, so it turns out that uh, drawing this by, by construction uh, or by inspection is actually fairly straightforward. So we would have uh, for the pull down network, we again, we're only using NMOS transistors. We put A on this side or in parallel, we'd have two transistors in series implementing B and C. Um, and then this is the output F. Okay, so that's that's you know just looking at the formula by inspection, uh, creating a pull-down network. Okay, and again, just to emphasize, what we're doing here is we have a we have an OR construct, so we put the two trans to two sets of transistors in series, and then we have an AND construct between B and C that we're putting uh, together. Um, uh, uh, sorry, the A and the B and C are in parallel, and then the B and C are in, are in series. Okay. All right, so that is the pull down network. The pull up network, we have to do a little bit of work, okay? Remember we have F equals A or B and C all barred, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to use De Morgan's theorem to simplify this formula a little bit. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna essentially take that top bar that's barring everything and bring it down into the formula. So this is equivalent to A bar or B and C barred. Okay, which is equal to A bar or, or, sorry, and B bar or C bar. Okay, so that's a direct application of De Morgan's theorem. Okay, so it turns out useful constructs for PMOS transistors are exactly the same as they are for NMOS transistors if the inputs are complemented. Uh, and in this case, the function has complemented inputs. Okay, so what we can do is exactly the same thing that we did for the pull down network we, we, where we do this by inspection. What we say is we have A and B or C and all the inputs are barred here. Okay, and so what that means is that when we construct this, A has to be in series with B or C and B or C are in parallel. Okay, so we can draw the circuit as follows. We have our uh, two PMOS transistors representing B and C in parallel, uh, going through a an additional PMOS transistor representing A, and that's our output. Okay, so again, what we did is we just made sure to use De Morgan's theorem. We constructed our pull up network essentially by inspection by just looking at the formula and making sure that uh, ands turn into series connections and ors turn into parallel connections okay so we can take this and put it together all right so let's just draw the the, the whole circuit I, I think it's hopefully fairly obvious about how we would put this together but uh, just for completeness let's just go ahead and do it so again, this is the pull up network. So we have A, B, and C. And you'll notice I had C on the other side uh, in, in the previous example. I'm flipping it here. It really doesn't matter. They're just in parallel. Uh, logically, it's effectively the same thing. Uh, and then we go down to our pull down network where we have our NMOS A over here, and then B and C are in series, B and C. And then the output here is F. Okay, now the beautiful thing of um, the, 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 the beautiful thing of, of this course uh, when you construct lo Boolean logic gates is when you're done, you can just check your answer and see if you're right. Okay, so let's verify. 
Uh, if a equals 1, what can we say? Well, if a equals 1, the pull down network is always on. And the pull up network is never activated. OK, so that's good. If A is 1, then the output, the answer, is going to be 0 no matter what. It's A or B and C, all barred. And so if A is 1, it doesn't matter what B or C is, that sum is going to be equal to 1. Uh, that gets complemented, so the output is going to be 0. So this is correct. OK. Now let's just go through a specific example. We could go through the entire truth table if we wanted to, but uh, let's just pick a, a particular example. ABC is equal to 0, 1, 0. Uh, in this case, um, what would happen? Well, A is 0, so, so, so this, uh, the, the, this part of the pull-down uh, network is off. B is on, so that's on, but C is off. So let's just draw it like this. So the pull-down network's not on, OK? On the pull-up network, A is 0, so this PMOS transistor is on. B is 1, so this PMOS transistor is off. But C is 0, so this PMOS transistor is on. Okay, So this means that the pull-down network is off. The pull-up network is on. And yes, that's correct. And so we can kind of just you know keep going. We can go through the whole truth table if we really want to, but effectively this just shows that um, um, you know it, our equations uh, or, the, or the way that we've constructed this uh, CMOS gate is correct. Okay, so that does it for this lecture. Um, in the next lecture, we're going to get back into uh, MOSFET modeling, looking at the MOS equations, and and uh, learning a little bit more about how to characterize these types of circuits.